So, the first time I met Nigel was through email. He asked if I wanted to work on the Serious Sam franchise, and I thought he was a scammer. <laughs> I couldn't believe it to be true that I get to work on the Serious Sam franchise. It was something I loved as long as it had been around. I thought it was amazing. Uh, for the younger people out there, imagine if someone asked you to work on Dark Souls, but this is a surreal Dark Souls with like exploding clouds or something. Anyway, it would be a dream come true. Nigel continued and um, saying he was creating an entirely new sort of marketing promotion for Serious Aim 3, which was to invite three indie developers to do their own take on the Serious Aim series. Along with Blambeer, Gerad, um, our group Mommy Quest Games went on to make original Serious Aim games for Devolver Digital. The promotion is still referenced to this day as uh, a hit and it was a very original approach. But that's Nigel's industry manner. He's laid back, but extremely insightful and intuitive about industry trends. He loves games, he knows games, and today he's here to share some of his insights with you. From public publisher of Auburn Digital, please welcome Nigel Lord. I did scale him. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't realize that I scanned him pretty good. He scanned my heart. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It was awesome to work with Nathan on uh, that project. Um, and thanks for having me here uh, at Vector Topics. It's very cool to be here. Uh, again, uh, my name is Nigel. I have a short, hopefully, uh, but hopefully insightful presentation um, about called when good ideas aren't good enough. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to kind of question what you were working on when you were working on your games. Uh, what is a good idea with making a game and uh, how to challenge yourself and have your peer group challenge you and challenge your peer group uh, to openly and honestly critique your work uh, and help us make something great, just not good, but great. Uh, it's a somewhat casual discussion. I really, I changed this even up to last night. That's why I'm actually going to have to look at the notes line because it's kind of a hard discussion to have about what is a good idea um, and, uh, and what this means in a, you know, what a good idea means in the game. And I actually do need quite a bit of slides uh, just because I thought they were extraneous. Um, so the short introduction I'm going to give about context and my perspective, uh, Nathan told you a little bit about what I do, but give you a little context of you know, what position I'm coming from. Uh, then I want to chat about what a good idea is, um, in my opinion. And this is all very subjective, and then maybe what a great idea might be, and what the difference between those two uh, two things could be. But also, can you guys hear me okay? You start in the back, blonde hair. Thumbs up? All right. <laughs> you look like the furthest back. Um, then I want to dive into something I'm going to call the good idea limbo. This is that space where you might have a good idea, but it kind of gets stuck for one reason or another. And this is, again, based off of experience and talking with developers. That's a place where I see games get stuck, developers get stuck. And uh, maybe it, this might help you know, push you guys out of it um, and start to uh, make your game different in a meaningful way. And then um, finally, uh, this notion of challenging ideas, right? I just mentioned this earlier. Uh, I think it's a really important part when you're at uh, conferences like this, uh, talking to peers, talking to friends, sharing your game, to be open and honest and you start challenging the ideas that you have. All right, this is your last chance to leave. We're going to close the door. We're going to lock it. Um, so I will preface this the whole thing with, I thought this was a 30 minute talk, so it will probably come in in 30 minutes, so uh, you don't have to sit and listen to me for the entire hour. Um, but I think that's another important point, actually, when I talk to developers, is uh, we always say put five hours of an extraordinary, interesting experience into a five hour game. Um, oftentimes developers will put five hours of an interesting, extraordinary experience into an eight hour game. And you guys all play those games you know, after a while they drag. So I think I try to apply this, this talk as well. Um, and it ultimately, uh, this will provide discussion, um, some thoughts uh, about you know, what it is, what good idea it is. And hopefully during the rest of this conference, you guys will be looking at the games you see here, could apply and, and talk with the developers and just amazing and tell them what you really think. Uh, so what's this guy's deal? Again, my name is Nigel Lowry, not British, from Texas. I live in Austin, Texas. I've lived in Texas my entire life. Um, and I work at a company called Baller Digital, and we're a small game publisher. Um, we work mostly with the developers of uh, you know, small studios, might be one or two people, maybe five people. In a rare case, in a game I'll talk about, there's a game with a developer size of 75 and both. But we mostly focus on uh, small independent games helping bring them to a uh, larger audience. Um, 
Um, my role is new business and marketing. So by new business, it means I look for developers to work with uh, games that I find interesting, developers I think they're doing something unique, and uh, ask them about partnering with them and, and publishing their games without bringing it to a larger audience. I go to game, uh, conferences like this one, to GDC, to E3, to PAX, whatever it, it might be, and talk to game developers and look at their ideas and see if this is something that I think our team would like to bring to uh, the masses, if you will. Um, and I also do marketing. So once that game is signed, we take that whatever that cool concept was for the game, and my role is to help show people what that is and communicate that through, through different marketing, whether it be events, trailers, uh, you know, uh, demos, how the game is presented, something like that. Um, again, for context, I'm going to give you my favorite game so you know, um, you know what I'm into. It gives an idea of what it sometimes draws me to good ideas. Uh, the best game ever, uh, factually, is Secret of Monkey Island 2. Followed uh, very close, closely by Indiana Jones and the Fifth Atlantis. That is another LucasArts point of adventure. That, did I get to hear a woo? Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, right there. Uh, it, it, it got overlooked a lot with the classics, but if you haven't played uh, Indiana Jones and the Fifth Atlantis, it's genius. It's a great story. Uh, Red Dead Redemption. I'm just going to go big with the AAA. I love that game very much. And then I'm going to shill for my own game that I worked on. I'm hot, not my game. I didn't make it. They would, be, they would shoot me if they heard me do that. <laughs> I, I helped promote it called Hotline Miami, but it is really one of my favorite games, uh, so I would be remiss to not mention that. Uh, the important part is the last part. I'm not a video game developer. I've never made a video game. I probably never will. I'm not that talented in that area, um, but I have. Uh, uh, eventually, would like to try it in my hand one day, but uh, I think it's important to know that I'm not a video game developer. I haven't made one. I'm not in your shoes for the most part. I haven't gone through this exact uh, struggles myself. However, um, I'm going to salvage my credibility a little bit here in that um, I work for a company, like I said, the Baltimore Digital. We see probably no less than 15 game pitches a week. Okay, This may be uh, some very small scope game ideas that come out, and other, uh, other times it's a uh, full vertical slice uh, demo or a game that is halfway done. Um, so we see a lot of games come through, a lot of ideas come through the door. Um, and also, I've been involved with hundreds of games, you know, whether it's just seeing these pitches or being involved with the developer during the production. We get to see, I have, you know, I get exposed to and work very intimately with developers from all different places with different ideas, uh, different stories to tell, and different things they want to share. So, what that leads me to is, and this is maybe where I get this, this idea, what part of the idea for this discussion came from, is I've had to tell people in the middle of five minutes, more than I like. Um, you know, if you get 15 game pitches a week, you can imagine if you don't do like maybe eight games a year if you publish. So I have to tell developers, uh, no, we're not interested in publishing your game. And I also have to tell them why. Um, because rightfully so, they want to know why isn't my game interesting enough, or why don't you particularly like it. And oftentimes it's just because we can't work at it, or we have something similar, or we're kind of full. But other times I have to tell them there's nothing specifically unique maybe about this game, or it's not quite there yet, right? And it's a good idea, but it's not there yet. Um, again, I hope this discussion helps you in your work and helps drive maybe you to think critically about the games that you're, uh, games that you're working on. So, cutting to the chase, good ideas and great ideas. This is eternal struggle. Everyone comes up with it. I have ideas for games. Developers I work with will tell you I have ideas for games. <laughs> and uh, they're not necessarily good. They're not, they're not great. Definitely not great. They're not good. Uh, but they're going to be unique. And everyone has these ideas. Everyone in this room probably has you know, one or two, at least one's on right now in your head. So what happened, and the reason this talk came about, or the reason I came up with specific content is, I have something that happened recently, I'll call it the Chingo incident. And this was, I was at Pax East this past year, and I was, um, I was probably really crazy over there. Look at that one. It's, much, it's very beautiful over there. Uh, I was at Pax East this past year in Boston, and I was sitting talking with a developer that we work with uh, named Gabe, and he teaches at the NYU Game Design School. He's also working on a, a game called Gabe Doctor Publishing. And uh, we're just chatting, a friendly chat, and one of his students comes up, and uh, it just happened to be a Pax East, and so we're talking. And uh, he's telling me a little bit about his game. And I said, uh, well, you know, tell me more about the, the big game you're working on for your, I guess it's their senior thesis, or you know, whatever you want to call it, senior project. He says, well, it's a basic platformer, and you were uh, start at the bottom and you kind of work your way up to some other kid of yours. You just kind of go up and up and you're, you're, uh, you're set within the pachinko machine. I was like, so what's, what's makes it different? What's different about this? And he says, well, you're a pachinko ball. You're a pachinko machine. You start 
start at the bottom, you jump up. You're not familiar with the Chinko, this thing that the ball drops down and go to the bottom. Well, his idea was you're trying to go up this year, a ball going up. And I stopped and said, What's interesting about this game? What's unique? And he goes, I just told you it's the Chinko machine. <laughs> that's not that's not it. That's not there's nothing that is a platform. So far you've only told me it's a platform. There's nothing about the gameplay other than uh, you know, the jumping up the platforms. There's nothing else about this that I genuinely think is unique. And I wasn't trying to be uh, he was a very nice guy. It was a very friendly conversation. I wasn't trying to be aggressive or confrontational about it, but I wanted to challenge the idea that he thought that this maybe was something that was, you know, a grand idea that had come up. Um, and so we got to talking. It got to me thinking. That discussion actually sat there. The, the, the professor, the student, and I talked about a lot of these things we'll talk about here. What genuinely makes uh, games different? We saw this yesterday with the, if you weren't here for the aforementioned uh, game pitch uh, contest. Uh, there's a lot of pitches that would start around uh, a setting or a narrative and things like that. And it, it, it gave context to it, but it wasn't the idea of the game, game the things you play, right? And in a lot of sense, that it didn't give you that mode to mode with gameplay. And so, and since then, I've been thinking about this quite a bit because this is really part of my job. This is part of what I look for, what makes a game different and unique. So, now I don't shut the fuck up. Tell me what a good idea is. Well, I, I don't know the answer, but um, I can give you some indications. Uh, most ideas are neat. Right? Everyone had it. If you look at someone who's just throw, I can throw up right now, and you say, oh, that's good. That's not necessarily interesting. Um, a good idea is something a little bolder, a little riskier. It's trying to push things a little further. There are thousands of good ideas, though, out there. Uh, there's thousands of games released each year, and I'd argue all of them have some form of neat idea, um, maybe a good idea. And it's on that rare occasion that there's a great idea, okay? And the great idea is something that, we'll get into this a little bit, singular, unique, something that stands out, and that we should all be striving for. It's easier said than done. I'll get into this a little bit. It's easier said than done, right? It's you know, everyone wants to have uh, Minecraft, or I use the example here, super hot. Um, it's not easy to come up with, but we should be striving for this thing. And, and really, that applies to anything we do. But you should be striving to get that greatness rather than settling for. I think this is a good idea. Struggling and continuing to work. So um, I was thinking about this more. How do I expand? How do I give examples? And from looking at the pictures that I see, um, these might be obvious. This might seem obvious. Uh, but I think it's worth at least mentioning again. A good idea is an element that intrigues, okay? Something that at least stands out. Something you're going to say to someone that they can at least pay attention to. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it stands out. It's a unique to the experience. Uh, the, the referencing the Pachinko thing, I'd say that, you know, I'm not sure that just being in a Pachinko uh, machine really necessarily makes it wholly different, right? Um, your actual experience, your moment of experience is very similar to what you've done before. So how, did, how should these good ideas manifest themselves? I'd say it's in a gameplay hook. Um, you know, some sort of, it doesn't have to be revolutionary, but some sort of hook, something you can say, it's pointing that this is why it's different from other games in the genre. It might be an interesting narrative. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I'm tying a lot of things to gameplay, but there's very great examples, and I'll get to a few, of how an interesting narrative can be a good idea, and how a genre mashup, for example, might be a good idea. If you like JRPGs, you like bullet hell shooters, Put those things together, that might be terrible or it might be great. It actually, it sounds terrible when I say it out loud. But it might be a great, you know, it might be a good idea to, to try these different things. That's how sometimes they do man manifest themselves. Or just a simple nifty twist. Um, I use the example here because I can, uh, I'm not ripping on, but I can use my, I feel comfortable using the game that we worked on. It's a game called Shadow Warriors. There's technically two of them. What's that? <laughs> a fan. Oh, yeah. oh good. Um, all right, we can talk more about this later. I think it's a good idea, so I'll get into why I think that Shadow Warrior was a good idea. Um, here's a, if you're not familiar with it, it's a first-person shooter. Uh, the trick is to really focus on melee combat. You'll be able to pick up your whole goal is to get off swords, and you have this gameplay mechanic, this risk versus reward of do I get close and dominate these characters, um, or sorry, dominate these enemies with the, the melee attacks, or do I sit back range and kind of pick them off? And it was very neat, a very good idea. It set itself apart for sure. Um, it had a really, it kind of had a neat setting, um, it had some nice humor, all very much, I think, good ideas. Um, but none of them were revolutionary. I wouldn't put it on the pantheon of great ideas, right? Um, my point here is this game did very well, critically and commercially, um, so it's okay to have a good idea. You've executed well. I'm not saying everything has to be great. It's okay to have a good idea, but it has to be something. You have to not just say, I'm going to make a first person shooter. Layering in melee combat. May layering in, you know, some sort of parkour. Things like that is where you see, the, if I say par parkour first-person shooter, what do you think of? Right. You know what I'm talking about. 
they have a good idea there and they, they jump to it or they, they took hold of it and everybody knows what that is. So then how does this relate to maybe the idea of, uh, uh, or the concept of gray ideas? And to me that takes it up the next level. It's fascinating. It's not just interesting, it's fascinating, okay? It's something that really grabs attention. And it's unusual. I don't mean that it's weird. I mean that it's not usual. It's not something you usually would see. Um, and ultimately it becomes an iconic experience. And, and again, I'm not trying to say you have to have Minecraft, something that's totally singular, right? But when I say iconic, it means something that when you look at it, you hear about it, like you say something, if I said hardcore first person shooter, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? That's iconic. Um, it might manifest itself, and I, I tend to gravitate myself towards you know, gameplay innovation, something about the game itself, it's something you're doing in this game. You, the player, are doing this game that's innovative. Um, expert storytelling, I talk a little, I'll mention later, um, Stanley Parable, okay? That was something that was presented in a very, very unique, different way. Um, Gone Home is another you know, unique way of uh, telling a story uh, that isn't seen in every other game. And then an unexpected presentation. This one's a little, I mean, this might just be, uh, just, actually, Stanley Parable is another example of unexpected presentation. You're not really sure where it's going. You have an unreliable narrator. You have all these things going on. Those things, I think, would be really, really great ideas because there's not a lot of it out there. Um, so the best example I could come up with, and I want to kind of make an apples to apples comparison here with the Shadow Warrior, was Super Hot. If you're familiar, you guys familiar with Super Hot? Everybody? Literally everybody in the room. Uh, if you're familiar with Super Hot, that makes this, that cuts out 20 minutes of presentation. <laughs> Uh, but what they did is, uh, it's a brilliant gameplay mechanic. It's immediately you look at it and say, uh, wow, I've not seen that before. If you have seen that before, you should tell them. But I, I've never, I never saw that before. Uh, it was, they took this, not only did it have a brilliant gameplay mechanic, but they explored it thoroughly, right? It wasn't just this, um, uh, you're playing the exact thing, you play the actual game. You know, they, they put a lot of different situations, a lot of different things together that, to explore this mechanic, and it's executed Phenomenally, and wrapped in a beautiful presentation uh, with the aesthetic. Uh, so once you saw Super Hot in action, every time you saw Super Hot after that, you knew what it was. There's no mistake what game that was and what it was all about. Um, these are very rare, right? Uh, if I I really wanted to publish Super Hot, we talked to them. Uh, it didn't work out. They didn't be very successful. But it's one of those things you see. You go, wow! I want to play that. I want to be a part of it. I want to publish it. I want to scan those guys, I want to scan Nathan. <laughs> um, but this is very rare. So it doesn't mean, I'm not saying to everyone, you have to walk out here and you've got to make it super hot, right? You've got to strive for this. You've got to look critically at what you're working on and say, is this enough? Have I done enough? Have I thought about this enough? Because there are literally thousands of good ideas pushed out onto the market. Uh, you know, and I say this, when I say market, it's not just a commercial thing, it's so just, just sharing games publicly or we're going out to a, a show and demo the most peers. There's thousands of them released every year. I'm not breaking any news there. I think everybody, if you're a Steam user, or really purchasing video games in any capacity, you see how many new games are flushed out uh, every day. Uh, so we're not at a lack of good ideas, right? There's a surplus of them. So we need to push for greatness. We need to push, keep pushing along if we want to be able to stand out. And this, was, this is where I came to the conclusion that maybe, you know, Good ideas are necessarily, I, I use that title, good ideas may not be good enough, right? If, if your goal is to really stand out from the crowd. Uh, there's too many other uh, options to draw people's attention and admiration. So push yourself from uh, good to great. Well, that's that's easy, you know, easy to say, Nigel. Uh, I have a good idea, but how the, how the hell do I make it great? Um, well, the good news is I, I want to express here is I think good ideas, no matter what they are, can be great. It's just a matter of I'm not settling, I'm not, you know, continuing to work on them. Um, you need to ask yourself these hard questions. Is this something that's going to strike people as interesting? If I have to say it out loud at a pitch contest, uh, there's a couple instances, you know, like people would say their ideas. I think it, I can see them the faith in me gone, and they haven't thought it up, thought through what makes this really, really different. Because when the judges ask these questions, what makes it different, they didn't necessarily have a good answer. I think you need to have a good answer there, or maybe you need to you know, go back to the drawing board a little bit. I'm not saying start over. It's just reworking this idea a little bit. Um, even if you think that you have something interesting, something you bring something new to the table, it does not hurt to stop, sleep on it, not for a night, two weeks, for a month, for three months, but to work on this idea until uh, you think you really, really have something to deal with. Because in my job, well, someone will pitch a game to me, 
and it's neat. It's not quite, um, you know, there's 50 other games like it, maybe one I saw earlier that day. And then they end that conversation with, well, me and my friends have been, and we've been working on this for three years. And it's just like mind blown because it's, it's become that much harder to tell them no. You don't want to say, uh, this isn't that great after they've spent three years working on it. So I think it's very important to work and polish these ideas, these core concepts, before you ever start, you know, fleshing out everything else about the game. Um, and I think it's important to note that this isn't, the, uh, whenever I say something is great, these great ideas are not instantaneous. They don't just jump out of nowhere. Okay? These are all, and I can use these games because I feel, I feel confident in these games because I know the stories behind it. These are all games um, that I've worked on in some capacity um, with the Vault Digital. And I just kind of want to go through them because I think this illustrates the point. Hotline Miami, and you may not be familiar with any of these games, but I think it's super important that you are. But Hotline Miami, these are all for whatever it's worth, you know, critically and I think commercially successful games in some capacity. So I want to point out that Hotline Miami, for example, it was two other games before it was ever Hotline Miami. It was originally a game called Super Carnage that had the same basic gameplay loop, but none of the style was there, none of the, none of the music, none of the, the kind of art and aesthetic were there. It was that base core gameplay loop. We got pitched to us, it was called Cocaine Cowboys, um, and then added in this kind of Miami dark underbelly vibe, right? Um, and then finally when it came out, it was, it was Hollow So my point here is it was two other games, like fully functioning games before it was ever the thing you actually play today. And then the dungeon was a fucking title first. Like they came up with the name into the dungeon and they built this game around that. Like that's how ridiculous sometimes these great ideas can happen. Uh, they, there was nothing else but the title at first and, and they built a, a game around that concept, which, you know, that's not, I don't think that's super replicable. Um, the Talos Principle was a, a first-person puzzle game. Uh, uh, it was a, a war-winning first-person puzzle game, and um, it actually started as a concept in Serious Sam 4. It was an idea for a puzzle. Serious Sam 4 is a spatial puzzle workout um, that they loved, the developer pro team loved so much that they put Serious Sam 4, like their bread and butter, to the side, much to my dismay, to the side, and worked on the Talos Principle instead. And that went on to be probably their biggest game ever. Uh, so that was originally a piece of another game they drew out and expanded upon. This good idea they had, this great idea that they had, they expanded upon from another game. Real Force and Titan Souls are Lumendare games, which is a you know, big global game jam. Um, they started small, but they saw this, they saw this nugget, and they've done, you know, this was, none of the developers, this was not their first Lumendare. Like, this is the one they said, I can make this bigger. When we contacted them, they gave Souls and says, can you make this bigger? Because it's awesome. And they did. Um, and then Downwell, I think, is maybe the most relevant for this talk because Downwell is a bio developer. His name is Gojiro, who's out of Tokyo. He was, a, he was an opera student. Uh, he was at opera school in Tokyo, learning to become an opera singer, as you might, one might do at an opera school. And uh, he decided he did not want to become an opera singer. And so he said, Well, what, do I, what would I like? I like video games. So he sat down, he learned Game Maker, and he made a game a day for 30 days. It's like, I'm just going to go rip through this and come up with ideas after idea after idea and learn how to make a game, learn what a good game is. And he looked at those third games and said, this is the one I want to make. I want to make something called Downwell. And so my point again here is that the great ideas like this, you're not just going to just write down a paper your great idea. This comes from a lot of iterations, a lot of work, and they come from places unexpected, like a title or a puzzle or another game you want to learn. You think it's a great idea to make a, a full game out of it. Uh, the third part I want to talk about, casual water sip, is uh, good idea limbo. And this came while I was writing this presentation. Of like, okay, this is all well and good. I've seen a, a lot of things from what I've seen from my experience that might be worth uh, talking about here is where I see developers sometimes get stuck. They have good ideas, great ideas, ideas, right? They get stuck because they, they're in these spaces um, where they never really differentiate. And there's, there's common themes here. Like I can see these common themes um, between them of not being able to find your own kind of space to work in. Uh, and this is where good ideas get lost along the way and end up never standing out for some reason. So I'm going to go through a few examples here. And the one uh, the one area is style over substance, uh, misstep I call it. Um, you can have a very distinct visual style. It's incredibly hard to pull off. Uh, kiss your artist if you have an artist. Every day gently on the cheek. Very able to pull off something that's really interesting. Um, Firewatch, Oxen Free, and Fury are all examples of really, really old games we look at. You don't, if you're familiar with, you saw them before, when you see them again, it's like super hot, you know what they are. Um, but here, they all had a lot of substance uh, behind them, whether it was a narrative, whether it was gameplay, uh, humor, there was substance behind that, that beautiful, beautiful uh, game you're seeing. So we see this a lot. 
lot. You can see sometimes uh, uh, really nice art. Uh, but there's no substance necessarily behind the game. They haven't really thought through the actual game itself. They got too enamored. And I'm just as guilty of this in my work as well. You get too enamored with how something looks. Uh, I wanted to make really nice slides, but an hour looking for good examples, but I got too enamored with how it looks and I needed to go back and make a better presentation with having an actual substance to it. Substance to it. Um, and then going back to Superpods, that's a great example. Right? That game with any art aesthetic, uh, art design uh, style, would be, uh, would be great. They just have to have both, right? Um, but if you put any sort of art style on that gameplay mechanic, I'm still confident that would be an excellent game. So a distinct visual style is not necessarily a good idea in itself. It's great to have, but it's not a good idea. Um, the next one I'd say I'm calling the so-called spiritual successor. Uh, nostalgia is a very powerful thing. If you saw my favorite games list, you know, I, I will still tell you all the old games better than new games, despite how much I love the new games still. Uh, but I think sometimes developers we see can get in trouble because uh, they have this sense of nostalgia. They want to recreate something they've played before, uh, they loved before, um, and they do it to a fault, maybe. Um, they focus on the spiritual part, meaning they uh, want to make the same game again, and not the successor part. They're not adding anything less to they're not adding anything new to the table. They're not bringing anything new to the table. So it's too quite tied closely to uh, their, their, their inspiration. Um, in fact, you know, I like all these games. Uh, Ukulele, Observation, and, and Road Redemption. And they're all very much inspired by, and sometimes created by, the people who made the original ones. And Ukulele is a, it's a cool game. It's like if you go look at the reviews, they got criticized for this. Because it was, it was definitely like the 90s era's uh, Nintendo 64 3D platformers, but maybe too close because it had some of the same problems. Um, so it's important, I think, that developers, um, you know, definitely draw inspiration and, and it's great to make a spiritual successor. I'm a sucker for spiritual, spiritual successors, but it's also important to bring something new to the table where you get caught in this, this limo I'm talking about. We never really break out the original that you uh, that people have played. Uh, the next one I'd say is the new twist on the genre, which is another easy, um, and I, I don't mean easy in a bad way, an easy way to kind of come up with ideas like, what is it you like and how can I bring something to the table? Portal is a great example of this. Portal defined, you know, I'd say it was redefined the first person puzzler. Um, as well, too, they're just, you know, they're gold standards of these games. And then you look at something like, uh, they really expanded that genre, like things really took off, right? Like what people were interested in doing, making these first person puzzles. <laughs> Games like Stanley Parable and the Palace Principle that I mentioned before brought something new to the table, whether it's through how puzzles are solved, whether it's through the narrative. They're, 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 they're doing something similar to our portal in some sense, but definitely brought something new. And that's why they probably did well. Um, another game like Answer Chamber, The Witness, they're all brought something new to the table. But what we see a lot of, for example, uh, going back to my experiences, is when people bring in games and say, uh, it's Portal, but with magnets. It's Portal, but with shadows. It's Portal. Three portals, right? And and the problem there is it's still just portal. Okay, it's still the same basic thing that you're doing. You have you know a plus and a minus, a, a blue portal, a orange portal. It's still it's all the same thing. It's a nice twist, but maybe it's not going to be enough when you finally get it out there. And people go, yes, this is a four man's portal, and that's the, the last thing you want to hear. The last one I'm going to mention is uh, the unrealistic ambition. I think this is uh, my particular job. If you work with smaller developers, this is sometimes uh, uh, one of the biggest traps. So it's important to dream big. It's important to definitely, you know, make the big push yourself, push your push your limits of what you think you can do. But it's just as important to make sure you work within the uh, space of your team and uh, what's realistically possible at the time. You're going to grow as a developer at the time, so make sure you work. If you're pushing yourself, and make sure you work with whatever's possible because everybody loves Dark Souls. Almost everybody loves slash hates Dark Souls. Um, the games I'm showing here are Necropolis and Aether. Both uh, Necropolis is out and Aether is not yet. Both are where their Dark Souls inspiration on their sleep. They all work within a, uh, a space and with a scope that's manageable by the small teams that are creating them. Um, what happens, again, going, going back to what we see, when we presented it, I literally was presented this a couple months ago. Uh, someone would come and say, here, this is, a, this is Dark Souls, just like Dark Souls is sci-fi Dark Souls, and it was a team of five people, and they're trying to make something as big as Dark Souls or Demon Souls or Bloodborne, and you can tell. So they were trying to overextend themselves, overextend what they're really capable of doing, and um, 
I'm not trying to smash dreams here, but I'm just saying make sure you work within the, the capabilities that you and your team are, are, are doing. Because if you try to extend too much, you'll, uh, you'll, it, it leaves this kind of empty feeling to the game. I mean, it isn't really fully fleshed out. And you need to focus you know, uh, more on what you can do right, what you can do well. I had a lot more of these things, and good idea, Lamona, this is why I wanted to cut last night because I went to four people. But there's a lot of different themes that you can see where people jump into. I talked about the ones at the top. But you know, there's little things like the overextended mechanic. A big, you know, when you look at those low Nari game jam games, there's a lot of neat mechanics, and not all of them are going to apply and turn into a three-hour game. They're really neat, maybe an hour or a half hour. But sometimes you see people not being able to extend their mechanic, uh, or push it into new ways or new interesting things to, to fulfill an entire three, five, eight-hour game. And the last one is the essence of the accidental clone, which you know, just, that's just a that's people basically working, focusing, big driving, taking inspiration from something. And then uh, they look up and they realize they've, uh, someone else is doing the exact same thing. They never bother to look around or they never deviated at all from their, their inspiration to just have their own art style. So how do we solve this thing? How do we, how do we make good ideas great ideas? Again, not a game developer. This is all from my perspective of, uh, of, of what I see. And I think the most important thing that I hear from developers, the most important thing I see developers do is this idea of challenging, or this concept of challenging ideas. Um, both your ideas, your own ideas, and your peers' ideas. So I mean, challenge yourself, right? Strip away, uh, you saw everyone, uh, again, going to the, the game pitch thing. Strip away everything else about this game. Tell You can tell a little bit about the narrative, the setting, and everything like that. But strip away that core concept and, uh, and challenge what making, what's really making that special. What's the core concept of your game? Going to the Chingo effect here, the, the Chingo example. Strip away everything. At the end, if, it's, if all you have to go on is just saying it's a platformer, that is in itself is not going to push you out. Um, so work on it, massage it, keep, keep being brutally honest with yourself. Like you're the first person, you're the first line of defense in making sure you don't do something that isn't uh, already done out there. Uh, do your research, look around, play other games. Um, be brutally honest with yourself. And accept your results. It's okay. It's okay if you come to the conclusion that it's not great. Don't be, don't be fearful. In fact, hope for that almost. You should be accepting these results that this maybe isn't um, isn't what your isn't your best idea and accept it and work on it. Um, and to do that, you need to seek criticism. I think a lot of people sometimes um, work in isolation, just not because they're hermits or anything like that. It's just you know they want to focus on it and they don't want to talk about the game. They're not ready to share it quite yet. They're always are not quite ready to share it quite yet. You'll hear that a lot. Um, they'll make internal excuses of why it's not ready to share when they should be sharing it. Um, you should go to conventions like this one or conferences like this one. Go to conventions, um, share with friends, share with family, put it on the internet. There's so many places. Uh, put it on itch.io um, to, to, to get people to play it. Um, and, and explain enough, but take your hands off the wheel a little bit. You want people to play it and give you honest feedback. You want to over explain it because then they're just going to spit back what you just told them. You want to see them play it. You want to feel and, and recognize what maybe goes wrong or what's not being communicated well or what they're not getting. Uh, and then repeat that process. Right? Go back to work on it and then go back out there in the, in the crowds and, and, and seek that criticism. Um, and then challenge others. Like, this is, uh, this is I have the same problem, whether it's telling, you know, giving feedback to developers. Uh, criticism can be a lost art, right? Like, actual criticism. Criticism has got this negative connotation now. Criticism sounds like a negative thing. It shouldn't necessarily be a negative thing. Critique and criticism is something that you should be, uh, you should be giving to your, your, your community, people that are around you that you're working with, whether it's in this program or friends um, online. Um, you got to be honest. You're not doing anyone's, anyone any favors. If you tell them you like the game or you think it's neat or you love the game and you really don't, you're just, you're, all you're doing is uh, hurting them. You're, hurting, you're in, in, impeding their progress. Um, and don't beat around the bush. Don't flower it up. Like, just be honest. Tell them, like, hey, this isn't working for me and this is why. Right? Don't just say this is shitty. Uh, tell them this is not great, but this is why I don't think it's great. You can give that clear feedback. It's an uncomfortable thing to do. It's an uncomfortable thing to say to somebody that's sitting right in front of you that's just told you, I've worked on this game for a long time, and that you're going to uh, tell them why you don't think it's that great. you got to get past that uncomfortableness, because that's when you really start to help one another. Um, and then finally, this is the warning, I guess, is criticism will then seek you. If you don't seek it, it will seek you. Um, when you have held on to your game or you've not maybe shared it and you're ready to share it with the world, um, the world will be brutally honest with you. Like, everyone's been
been on the internet, I should tell you. If you haven't been on the internet, I suggest you try this. It's really good. <laughs> um, but the internet will be brutally honest with you. Um, and people you don't know will be brutally honest with you. If you strive to put something out there, whether entering in a contest, sharing it in some sort of community, or trying to sell it, uh, putting it on Steam or putting it on the edge or just selling it directly, um, you're going to find out very quickly criticism will come to you. Um, and it's not about having this thick skin. I'm not saying you need to build up a thick skin to, to repel the criticism. What you need to be able to do is understand it, process it, and act on it. Um, and that's why I say you should be seeking criticism. Um, and it's not something to be feared. It's subjective opinions. If someone tells you, um, to use foul language again, it's a shitty game, um, it's okay. Someone else might really love it. Like, no, one, no one likes everything. Um, I promise you. I promise you for my job. No one likes everything. I mean, our, our most, what I think are our most beloved games will have someone giving it a 2 um, out of 10. Um, and it's just because they don't like it. Uh, the goal is to create something great, and that won't really happen without uh, your ideas being challenged. So, uh, in conclusion, I think that, you know, uh, hopefully um, the, the thoughts that I'm leaving with are, I'm just going to say them again, you can be left with them. Is there are a lot of good ideas out there in games, and having one uh, isn't that unique anymore, right? But good ideas aren't really that far away from being great ideas. That developers really should be, and you guys should be challenging yourself, challenging your peers, and really, really being honest and brutal, peeling everything back and finding out what is good about the game. If it's not good about the game, you need to maybe make something different or re rebuild it from there. Uh, find that core concept that's going to make your game, make your game fun, um, and work on that because in the end, that's all that's going to matter. You can have the Pachinko machine, you can have the melee action and things like that, but if you don't have that core concept that makes it different, um, you're, you're, you know, it, it's going to be it's going to be a, a tough struggle. Um, but like I said, good ideas can be great. It's just a matter of challenging them. Um, I have left a full probably 30 minutes now, so we have to I'm going to demand you all give me questions or have some discussion or even criticism. Um, I'm happy. And if it's not here, if you don't want to do it here, I'll be here the entire day. If you want to talk about these ideas or what these talks are, and tell me that this is um, wrong, I want to hear that too. Um, I want to hear what you have to say about this. But thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, 